Hi, I'm Mary Cameron. I'm your regional coordinator for the Midlands uh, for BYHS. Um, and it's just it's so great. You could all take the time out of your day to join us for this hour. This is um, fantastic. And we have quite a treat in the store for everybody. Um, we have Chris Steele with us today. Chris is a noise and vibration specialist inspector for uh, the health and safety executive. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about his background. So Chris carries out inspections and investigations of workplaces focusing on noise at work and our vibration and whole body vibration issues. Uh, Chris has worked in noise and vibration control for more than 20 years, um, moving from product development, consultancy to academia to regulation. Um, and it would seem, Chris, that your reputation precedes you because this webinar has by far gathered the most signups we have ever had for a regional webinar. It's just amazing. Gosh, I think it's double what we had last time. So uh, no pressure or anything, right? <laughs> It has gathered so much interest um, and we're, we're just so happy everybody can join in. So thank you very much. Very, very appreciative to all the attendees. Very appreciative to, to Chris for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. You put together these fantastic slide um, slides for us and um, you'll be taking it, taking us through it all today. Um, so Chris is going to be talking around uh, the research work and recent updates from the HSC regarding workplace noise and hand arm vibration. And from here, I'm going to pass over to Lee from the BOHS. He's going to go over more of the technical side of things, and then we'll jump straight into Chris. Thank you for that. So, um, yeah, it's only a quick one for me. So um, after the presentation, we'll do uh, a Q&A session, which you'll know if you've uh, been with us for a regional webinar before. So um, in the past, it's been with GoTo, where it's been you've typed your questions in, but with Teams, it gives us the opportunity for you to actually have a, a normal conversation with, with our panelists today. So. Um, in the top uh, top of the screen, for anybody who's not familiar with Teams, there's a little man with a hand up. If you just highlight that and click on the raise hand button, it'll have a little hand next to your um, name on my screen here. I'll be able to just call on you for your question, and then you can unmute yourself, have a conversation, and then just mute yourself again. And then anything you need to uh, type in, you've got the little speech bubble at the top there as well. So just type any questions in, I'll be able to do it um, that, That's pretty much it from a tech side for me so I will pass over to Chris to begin the webinar then so Chris you're just muted there if you just want to mute, unmute yourself and um, off we go uh, can you hear me now yeah yeah right. your audio is good for me good stuff okay so uh, my name is Chris Steele I'm a noise and vibration uh, inspector with the HSC Normally when I do talks, I'm usually talking about how to meet the regulations and what the HSE looks for. So uh, please forgive me if there's a little bit of that in here. But essentially what I'm going to talk today about is, is the type of uh, research work that goes on at the HSE. Uh, some of you are probably aware that we've got a nice big lab out in Buxton. And uh, if you look at something like this, you probably think, well, that's quite a, an expensive thing for the government to run. And um, what do you actually get from it? Uh, so the things that I'm going to talk about today is actually done by a very small team within this building. So this is just one aspect of what goes on at HSE Buxton and it's just the noise and vibration uh, people. So it should give you a feel for, you know, the kind of uh, work that they do and, and the value of it. Uh, one of the things that is probably worth saying is that everything that our scientists do is directly linked to helping industry. Now, I know that if you've been taken to court by the HSE, it probably doesn't feel like we're trying to help you. Uh, particularly if our science scientists are there saying that they've done some work on you know some of the things that, that, that they've found issues with but genuinely the work that they do there is is all geared towards trying to figure out ways to try and stop people from being hurt at work or made ill at work and this should hopefully kind of give you an explanation of how that works when it comes to something like noise and vibration so at the end of this talk Hopefully what you should you should know is that why HSE keeps doing vibration testing, because you'll probably see that we keep doing vibration testing. And why do we keep doing that? You should have an understanding of what HSE's position is on vibration monitoring. Uh, we did some some work recently on, on some vibration monitoring systems. Uh, and then there's a bit of a gear change towards the end when I'm going to talk about what the noise risks are in construction. So this covers three of the sort of main things that have been put out by the HSE over the past 12 to 18 months. But they all kind of fit in together and you'll see that as we go through. So let's start off by looking at what HSE uh, is doing or why we keep doing vibration testing. 
So you may have seen on our RR page, if you go on, a, if you Google HSE RR reports, you'll find all our research report, reports, and you'll find over the past couple of years we've, we've been consistently putting up re reports on standardised me methods of testing for vibration. And you probably say, well, why do we keep doing that? Well, it's all kind of culminated in uh, a big test report that we put out last year, which was about reviewing uh, test codes and declaration codes for vibration emissions. Um, and this is mainly because we want to understand what's going on with these things. So HSE's gathering vibration data to help industry understand and control their halves risk. But what do we want from that data? What do, HSE, HSE, what do employers want from vibration data? Uh, well, first thing, what we tend to find as employers, what they're looking for is they want to know what's the vibration magnitude, what's the meters per second in use when they're typically doing what they do. So if, for example, you buy yourself a rock drill and you're going to use that, you as an employer want to know how much vibration I'm going to get from that rock drill when it's drilling rocks. That seems pretty reasonable because you need to use that information to help you populate your uh, assessment of exposure. What do manufacturers want from vibration uh, data? Well, actually, what they want is slightly different. I mean, to be fair, they also want to have that information, that in-use information, so they can tell the employers what their tools get but they also have a kind of requirement to make sure that the tests are reproducible and repeatable and um, that's quite a big thing for them they, they want to understand that if they test one product off their line and then wait six months and test another one that they'll get a result that you know is comparable with the last one they've done and they also want to be able to compare against test results done by other manufacturers in other locations in different parts of the world where their tools are being tested so that it can be re reproduced and repeated uh, because of that, you end up with slightly odd things like uh, the dyna load, which is uh, a methodology that's used for testing breakers. It's essentially a, a steel tube full of ball bearings uh, or metal balls. So it's not really very, you know, comparable with, say, drilling into concrete or tarmac, but it's hopefully it gives a, a very standardised method of measurement. So what is... Uh, what does HSE want from vibration measurements? Well, we kind of want, well, we want three things actually. We want we want the same thing as what, what you want as an employer. We want to know what the magnitude are of tools when they're in use so that we can tell you this is what the typical vibration magnitude is of a tool. We also want the same thing as the manufacturers want. We want to know what the data is when you test it in these standardized measurement methodologies and um, to find out, you know, how good are those methods for doing the test? Are they, are they um, you know, a good reliable way of getting good reliable data and the third thing that we want is to see what's the difference between these two what is the difference between these laboratory based tests and what's the difference when you test that tool on site so if we go and have a look at things like percussive drills hammers and breakers then we produce sort of data like this and what we have is a range of tools tools a through to i and we, we do a range of tests on them. So the first thing that we do is we get a hold of the manufacturer's laboratory data. So for tool power tool A, the manufacturer's expecting this to get 30 metres a second, so quite a high result. The next thing that we'll do is that we'll go and get that power tool and we'll go and measure it under site conditions. And because there's a quite amount of variability in site conditions, we tend to look at what the 75th percentile is because we tend to think of that as the average. And so we say, well, on average, when you test this power tool on site, you actually find that it gets about 15 metres a second. So in the basis of this standardised test, it looks like it's doing the manufacturer a bit of a disservice if he's telling people it gets 30, but actually when it's used in use, it gets 15. Then the third thing that we do is that we then go and do a measurement of the power tool using the standardised test in our own labs. So we do a lab test on it. And in this instance, we found out that it was getting less than five metres a second. And that raises all sorts of questions, you know, is there an issue with the way the manufacturer's done the measurement or is there an issue with the way that the HSE's done the measurement or is there an issue with the standardised test methodology and that's the sort of thing that happens. And so when we look at the, the results in the round, when we look at a range of tools, we, we find things that start to become a bit more obvious. So we find that uh, actually when you test the tool on site for these particular types of tools, we find that the vibration levels are typically higher than what the standardised test is. And we also find that there's variability between the way that each the way the HSE's got results using the standardised test and the way that the manufacturers have got results. 
So what can we infer from that? Well, we can infer that for the majority of tool types covered, test code, this particular test code, doesn't produce vibration magnitudes that are representative of the in-use vibration, the only exception being for rock drills. So any risk assessment based on emission values generated by this test code would be likely to result in a serious underestimation of in-use vibration risks. Oops, we've gone. <laughs> and we're back. Uh, hopefully, can you? I wonder if somebody could just tell me if you can hear me and see me. Yeah, got um, got the slides back up. We can hear you again. Sorry about that. It's typical the, the five minute drop. Uh, so, as I was saying, we, we find out that there's an issue with this test methodology, and we said there about the the dyno load thing. You know, it's a bit of an odd setup, but it's it's been produced because of the hope is that it gets reproducibility and repeatability. Uh, but actually what we're finding is that's maybe not the case. So what happens if we, we assess the dyna load and we look at testing the pneumatic breaker uh, using a standardised concrete breaking test method? So we find that if you break it in concrete, it's almost 100% representative of the tool in use. But if we use the dyna load, it's maybe 25% representative of the tool in use. And so from that, we infer that that dyna load for test vibration emissions may not be suitable for generating values that reflect the upper quartile of the in-use magnitude. So that then leaves us as HSE with a question about, well, do we go back to industry and say, you know, we've got a concern about this standard, how are we going to address it? Uh, what do we do with that, that issue? So are test emission codes always an issue? Is it always the case that when we use this standardised test methodology, uh, that we always get results which are indicative of the test codes not being representative of the power tool in use. Well, the answer to that is... Uh, I, have a screen, I have a screenshot because they're still sent it on to me. I'll share it. If I... Yeah, hang on a second now. Shall I just find it? Hello? It's, who is that? <laughs> uh, so... Um... <laughs> Sorry. Right, so... Do the test emission codes always, are they always an issue? Are they always not representative of the power tool in use? Well, the answer to that is, is no. Uh, some power tools, the, the test code is, is good. So, for example, uh, pneumatic rammers, there's quite good correlation there. But for something like a, a chipping hammer, the correlation is not so good. So that's what this big report is. So we've produced this nice big report with all these test results. We have been testing um, standardised methodologies for a long time, and we find that some of them are OK, some of them are not. So. What do we do? Do we do we expect you? How do we use this information? Do we expect you as a duty holder, as a consultant, to go and hug out our test reports and wade your way through them and find out what's good and what's not good? Well, obviously, no, we don't. We take all that data that we've gathered, all that site data that we've gathered, and we start to produce it in a, in a format that's consumable by you as a duty holder or the end user, somebody who works in industry. And the way that that, you know, culminates or produces itself is in our HABS calculator. So you'll see that last year we updated our hand-down vibration calculator, so it's now got drop-down menus. So you basically you pick the power tool that you want. It will put in a vibration magnitude, which is that 75th percentile number that goes in there. And then all you've got to do, I see all you've got to do, is then put in the amount of time that you spend working with that particular power tool. And the other thing that we get from that data is we have our appendix table, uh, appendix three table, which is in our guidance document. And this represent this presents the, the these percentile in use data for you. And the purpose of this is that this is designed to help you understand how to purchase and pick tools. So the first, the Excel spreadsheet is there as a way of you undertaking your risk assessment and determining, do I have a problem? Typically, if I use these types of tools, I'm likely to have an issue. And then your next step is, OK, can I can I source tools that have got lower vibration? And that's where you move on to this table here. So let's say, for example, you want to go out and buy impact drills, a 5 to 8 mil impact drill. Then what we are saying to you is that we reckon the range on that is somewhere between 7 and 13. On average, it gets about 11. So if you're looking at product data and product manufacturers information, if they say that it's between 7 and 13, you can be reasonably confident that it's representative. If they're saying that it's well above that, um, it's probably an issue. And if they're saying that it's well below that, 
then you would question why that is. Now, it's not to say that there aren't power tools out there that are significantly lower than the range HSE has suggested. There certainly are. Uh, but if you see someone who's producing a power tool that says, yeah, we are lower than this range, then they should be able to demonstrate to you quite easily uh, why it's much lower. And there certainly are power tools out there that do that. I think crosscut saws are a good example of power tools where there are products in the market which are below the range that HSE states. OK, so we've got an understanding now of why we keep doing these vibration testing and we're giving you information that helps you, you know, do that initial risk assessment and also do tool purchasing. But there's that bit about all you have to do now is just just put in your your, your exposure times, which probably leads us on to something like HSE's position on vibration monitoring, because there is a, a perception that, that, you know, you need to do the monitoring, you need to understand how long they're using the power tools. So let's talk about that for a bit. Well, before we kind of get on to anything else, I think the first thing that's worth saying is that HSE doesn't approve or endorse uh, in vi vibration monitoring systems. Now, that's not to say that we don't think that they're that they're good or we think or we think that they're bad. It's just that we don't endorse products. We don't endorse products generally. I think the only thing that we put an endorsement on is the grip quality of some types of shoes. Uh, but generally, HSE doesn't endorse or improve products. Um, so if you see anybody saying, oh, this is HSE approved or HSE endorsed it, then that's probably not the case. Uh, certainly, if anybody's using the HSE logo, I'd be very surprised if that had been approved because you have to get that the use of that in writing, particularly if you're putting it on your product. And we certainly haven't done that for any monitoring system or measurement system or anything else that's classed as low vibration or anti-vibration. The next thing that's probably worth saying, and this is me probably getting back onto the how you assess risk, is that continual monitoring and recording of vibration exposure is not a requirement of the regulations. It's not something that we specifically ask for. Uh, we didn't ask for it when people were writing it down on a piece of paper. And even as the systems become more technical or technologically advanced, we still don't ask for it. Um, so why doesn't HSE ask for continual monitoring? Well, let's come back to our little calculator here. You'll see that we've, we've we, we talked before about this 75th percentile that we expect there to be variation in the vibration magnitudes of the tools. And when you look at the numbers that it produces at the end, you'll see down in the bottom here that we've got a little warning that says, even though you're not you're not at 100 points, the warning that's given in our calculator says exposure is potentially above 2.5 meters a second. And that's because when you're doing this initial risk assessment, when you're trying to figure out what your exposure assessment is to, to populate your risk assessment, the point of this is to say, look, are you or are you not above the regulations? And if you're relatively close to it, then the question at that point is, should the, the regulations be implemented? Should you implement your control measures? Should you have your information instruction training? Should you have your health surveillance? So that's the purpose of this. And we know that there's variability in the vibration magnitudes. And we know that when people are trying to figure out how long they're spending on their uh, power tool usage, that people make estimations, overestimations or underestimations on that. And it's something that's just endemic in it. Um, so some of you might have seen this graph. Uh, so one of our scientists at HSE, what they did was they went out and got a hold of a range of monitoring devices and said, OK, how, how, how well do they or how accurately do they represent the power tool in use, the time that the power tool is used? So each one of these bars represents a different tool, a timer or tool monitoring system used in a different way. Some of them are on the tool, some of them are off the tool, some of them are in the, the power line that's going into the tool. And we get what we find with that is that we, we're getting variations in, you know, the actual time that the power tool was in use and what the monitoring system was seeing that it was getting. So you know, some are better than others, to be fair. Some that we tested are no longer in the market and they don't necessarily represent what the product is that's that's in the market at the moment. But fundamentally, when we come back to our estimation of exposure, we're expecting there to be some variability in both the vibration magnitude and some variability in the vibration exposure time. So we're not... And it's a strange thing, I think, for us to say, but we're not hugely concerned about people being pinpoint accurate when it comes to understanding vibration exposure times. We want you to use the times and the magnitudes 
to give you an indication of do the mag do the regulations come into force and if they do you implement your control measures so where could monitoring systems be beneficial so you know it sounds like i'm being a bit jaundiced about monitoring systems maybe uh, there's things that we could say that, that are useful about them so let's talk about that uh, and this is what we're finding out from the work that we're doing we find that you know they could be beneficial and help you manage individual workers who need to have a close eye kept on them so someone who might have a diagnosis of halves but you want to let them keep working and uh, maybe because they're getting close to retirement uh, it's helpful for you to manage new jobs or tasks because if you're starting off something new you've got no idea how long it's going to take and so obviously there's an expectation that you will spend some of your time doing some assessment so that you can populate your risk assessment and then they're good for helping you manage and maintain job rotation and stuff like that and I think the key thing to note here is the word manage. Manage kind of suggests that we're doing administrative controls and if we come to our hierarchy of controls which you'll always see whenever anybody's talking about health and safety then we're talking about something that's quite low down in the hierarchy in fact for halves because there really isn't any effective PPE for halves we are technically at the bottom of the hierarchy so even if you are using a monitoring system and you're saying that that's one of the things that you're using to help control your risk particularly if you're doing it for ongoing monitoring and I don't even think I can't even imagine as many of the monitoring systems manufacturers who advocate doing ongoing monitoring on monitoring but even if you are doing ongoing monitoring we're still going to ask you questions about have you got engineering controls have you got substitutions have you got eliminations so just because you're using a monitoring system to do continual monitoring or ongoing monitoring we're still going to ask you questions about your other control measures because that's how we want you to focus your time on understanding your level of risk and exposure and focusing your activities on control and if you only have time to do one thing and i say this every time i do a talk focus your efforts on control and um, because reducing exposure is going to be the biggest factor in, in trying to stop people from getting halves and if you are a duty holder then this is how we expect you to split your time that the the bigger the box the more time you spend on it so the bulk of your activities would be on control anything in blue is a control activity and we want you to do your substitution and, and elimination the next biggest thing you'd spend your time on is information instruction and training and then health surveillance and you'll see that the yellow square is actually the smallest one that that's where we expect you to spend the least amount of your time so whether you spend one day one hour a day, one day a week, or every day of your, your working life dealing with halves, the risk assessment process of it should be the smallest part of it, and this control activity should be the largest. And the measurement and the monitoring for a duty holder is probably the smallest thing out of all the activities that you would do. I mean, understandably, if you're a consultant, then it's probably going to be a much larger part of your typical day. But if you're day-to-day -day working in an industry, and you're trying to run a business then the measurement and the monitoring should be a very small part of your control process right so uh we're going to go a bit of a gear change now because we've been talking about hand down vibration we're talking about vibration testing and, and monitoring and i'm now going to talk to you about noise and construction now the link here is actually that usually when i say to people you don't need to do ongoing measurements and ongoing monitoring then they'll come back and say, well, what about these jobs that people have where we don't know what they're doing, they're out all day, they could be using power tools for you know, unspecified amounts of time, how are we supposed to keep an eye on them? And this is actually where this research kind of falls in because we have a same, similar issue with noise, and in this case, we have an issue with noise and construction in that you've got a lot of peripatetic work, a lot of people moving from site to site, using variable different types of tools over the course of their day, and the construction industry said, we're saying, well, what, what are the risks? So, you know, HST went out and gathered noise data to help construction understand and control the risks of noise. So that's what our scientists went out and did. And they went off to a range of different construction sites and they got measurements on some key construction activities and said, right, if you do this task, what are you typically likely to be exposed to over the course of a working day? And then let's go back to industry and tell them this is what your sector, this is what you're exposed to. So if you work as a dry liner, typically if you do that job for five hours, it will put you at the lower exposure action value. And that sounds pretty reasonable because if you do dot and dabbing all day, you're probably not going to be using a lot of power tools. 
But if you're doing a bit of stud work, you might be using some cutting saws, that type of thing. So there's a small variability in tool use and, you know, the noise levels are slightly lower. If you look at something called first fixed joinery, which you might call first fixed carpentry, depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, we'll find that if you do that for three years, it'll typically put you at the lower exposure action value. However, if you do second fixed joinery uh, or carpentry, you tend to find that these people are at the lower exposure action value after an hour, and after three years, they're above the upper exposure action value. So you've got two relatively similar jobs are using similar types of tools, but we've got a variability in the noise and that tends to fall to things like, well, the first fix stuff, usually a lot of it's done outside. There's a lot more nail guns and while nail guns are noisy, the duration's very short. So the exposures are, are different. Whereas the second fix stuff is typically inside the building. Uh, one of the things they like to do is set up cutting stations in a particular room. That's a really good way of controlling noise and dust and a load of other things because you put it all in one space. But it means that the person who's working with that power tool uh, is exposed to quite a bit of noise when they're using it. We looked at demolition work, small demolition work. Again, the, the, a lot of these are focused on small construction activities because the people that we're most concerned about are small construction um, companies. There's a lot of self-employed people in construction. There's a lot of two and three person uh, companies in construction. And so these are the sorts of individuals that, that we tend to miss because the larger organisations are a bit better at understanding control. But demolition work, as you would expect, you know, 15 minutes of that puts you above the low, lower exposure action value, 45 minutes you're above the upper exposure action value. So we, we take that kind of information out to organisations like the Drilling and Sawing Association, who are, you know, a really kind of big player in, in things like concrete um, demolition. And, you know, they then set out and, and put out their own guidance on how to control noise, how to control vibration, how to control dust. So we can, you know, we, can, we, we see industry sort of motivating themselves as a result of finding out, yeah, we've, we've got an issue. So again, if we just, you know, I've put this slide up here on the hierarchy of control because I've not really spoke to you at all about any kind of control measures at this stage. And, um, you know, our scientists have been out gathering all this noise data uh, but what are they doing? Are they actually figuring out how to reduce this? Because it's great to know that it's noisy, but what are they going to do about it? So let's look at uh, concrete working. Typically an hour of that puts you above the lower exposure action value, two hours above the upper exposure action value. What could you possibly do to reduce uh, noise exposure or vibration and dust exposure in concrete working? Well, one of the things that our scientists found when they were going around to these sites and having conversations with the design decisions that went behind the working that was going on was that they actually found that the design decision was usually the key element in the exposure to noise. And really what our scientists have found is that by the time you get to a construction site and there's people there using power tools, you've missed a lot of the opportunities to reduce exposure to things like noise and vibration and dust. So on one particular site that we were on, they were doing uh, poured concrete foundations and we found that the initial design suggestion was to have prefabricated foundation retaining walls and that had to get changed because there wasn't enough time to put the design work in because they hadn't done the correct site works and site investigations beforehand. So you find these design issues have a knock on effect and by the time you get to site, if they're using the power tools, you've missed a lot of the chances to reduce it. We're then down to things like tool selection. So if you are doing scabbling, this is a scabbling tool. Basically, it's for roughing up concrete. So what they'll do is they'll pour concrete and they might rough it up because it's gone, gone hard overnight. So they rough it up so they can pour more concrete onto it and it gets a nice key. They'll use these types of power tools. There's not a lot of difference in noise, uh, but there is quite a lot of difference in vibration exposure, which to be fair, what do you expect? You've got one system where it's got an isolated handle uh, on the back, the one on my uh, right, the one that gets 42 metres a second, it's also got an isolated handle on the back, but for some unknown reason, the company's bolted a handle to the head of the tool where all the vibration is. So tool selection, you know, can and can't help uh, depending on what kind of exposures you've got. But once you're down at the, the level of saying, right, we're left with this problem, we have to use power tools, 
you have to be careful about which tools that you're picking. So uh, looking again at the hierarchy of control, when we talk about noise, we're then pushing ourselves down to PPE because if we've missed a lot of the opportunities to control noise because we didn't do it at the design stage and we're struggling to find power tools which are going to be quieter because essentially they're all doing the same type of work, then the only control measure we've got left when it comes to construction is PPE. So our scientists then respond to that and they produce uh, quality products that they can use on the HSE website. So one of the, the things that they've come up with recently is that we've updated our noise and uh, noise exposure calculator. And you'll see now that you can do things where it will, you can actually put in what the noise exposure is going to be. You can include the type of hearing protection that you're using and it will tell you what your exposures are and whether or not the hearing protection is working. We've also introduced or put up an updated hearing protection calculator and this has got quite a, a number of options on it. The first thing that's probably worth drawing your attention to is the introduction page, which you think is just a bit of chat to get you started. But actually, if you look at that little blue um, table there, it's a really useful little tool, particularly for the construction uh, industry, because it allows you to say, OK, I'm using a power tool that gets 95 to 100 dB. I should be using hearing protection that produces 25 to 35 a DB reduction. So it allows the, the, the on-site person to say, oh, I can do a quick estimation of whether or not I've got the right hearing protection based on the information I've got from the tool. And a lot of the times you can get that information straight off the manufacturer's website. And then you can check what it says on the, the hearing protection box or the packet that it's in to see that it matches. We've also then put up a, an octave band uh, method for the hearing protection, which I don't think we had before. Uh, this is particularly useful if you work in environments where there's frequency dependent noise. So if you work in a very uh, a, an environment where there's a lot of uh, low frequency noise or high frequency noise, it allows you to figure out whether the hearing protection you're, you're using will will make the difference that you want. It'll also tell you if you're under protecting. Um, the, obviously, the issue with this is you need to have quite a lot of data, quite a lot of data about the hearing protection and also measurements of the noise level on site. And that's why we've also got the, the new, more typical method, so the high, medium and low method for hearing protection. Again, this is again to help you with noise issues, whether it's low uh, or, or high frequency noise. And then we've got the standard SNR method, which you know most hearing protection um, manufacturers will have that on their products. And the reason why we've got all, all these different three types is because we're aware of the fact that depending on what you know, depending on how much information you've got in the hearing protection, um, might dictate whether or not you use this calculation or a different calculation. So if you buy a, a small packet of earplugs, it may only have the SNR number on it, whereas the the box of earplugs that you've got back in the in the, in the factory uh, might have a, a bit more data on it. So hopefully, uh, now as we sort of come towards the end of this talk, I've given you an indication of what HSE is. It keeps doing these vibration testing. We'll probably will keep on doing that to help gather more data on, on tools because we know that, that lower vibration tools are coming out and we also are going to use that information to go back and say look some of these standards we think we should have discussions about. Uh, hopefully you can understand our, our, our position on vibration monitoring and our position on, on vibration monitoring is that you know if you want to do it that's that's entirely up to you but it's not something the HSE specifically asks for and even if you are doing vibration monitoring we're still going to be asking you all those other questions about control and the last thing I spoke about there was noise and construction and the key sort of elements of that were that you know if you've gone past the design stage and you've missed a lot of opportunities to reduce noise we've given you some information on some key noise exposures for some key construction activities and really that's what fed into the production of our hearing protection calculator. So um, as again, I'll finish off just by saying that everything our scientists do is directly linked to help an industry. And that's really the, the, the way that it goes through. Sometimes it's not obvious to see what it is that they're doing, but genuinely everything that they get involved in usually ends up being filtered through out into stuff that we put on our website or we produce and give out to industry. We may not do it uh, as quickly as we'd hope sometimes, but it definitely is what we're trying to achieve. So. Um, 
I'll probably stop at that point. And if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I'll leave this up in case you're looking for um, just links to to the things that I've been talking about. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. That was so so thorough. Um, and gosh, yeah, you, you nailed it there. That was excellent. Um, so what we'll do now, going to Q and A. Um, if you can, you guys can either type in your questions to the box uh, just here, or if you want to raise your hands, um, I'll, I'll call on you one at a time um, if you wanted to, to to speak your question, and you can unmute yourself. Um, but you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit selfish. I'm gonna do my question first. Uh, so if that's okay, Chris, um, I, I was interested in the part you were covering about um, ongoing monitoring. You know, in general, not so much needed, um, but there are certain circumstances where on ongoing continuing monitoring um, could could be of help. Um, so you know, things like emergency work or if um, a person's had restrictions placed on their medical advice, you know. Um, so in those circumstances where where you, you could reason um, you you want to have on, ongoing monitoring um, and you're looking into on tool timers, which are the best type to get in? Um, from what I've read, quite a few out there are not so good. Um, the only one I've read about that has that's of any real good is the the inline pneumatic timers. Is that what you come come across as well? Is there any other uh, that they're... Well, it's not. I don't. The issue isn't, you know, whether one's better than than the other or or what the benefit is of of them are. And certainly, some of them, like the inline ones, you know, you can get inline pneumatic ones, but then you have to use pneumatic tools. And what if you go off and use a different type of tool? So the best ones, again, it comes back to, you know, what's right for you might not be right for somebody else, but it's the one that works best for the job that, that you're doing and the one that you feel is going to give you the most representative um, sort of information. So that's something, that's a discussion you have to have with a manufacturer to find out, you know, is this product right for what you do? And will it genuinely, and I think this is a key point, is will it genuinely put you in a position where you'll understand and know more than what you would do uh, using something else, using a paper-based system or just trying to, to reduce exposure? So it's 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 that aspect of it. I mean, I think one of the comments I made was that some of the, some of the systems we tested, uh, you know, they're no longer on the market. Uh, or they're in the process of being updated. And I think this is another thing to be aware of is that, um, you know, this is a an evolving and new market uh, and the products from what we've seen, you know, they are going through a product. Some of them are going through product development processes. They're trying to get a, a tighter, closer understanding of, you know, how exactly do we get this to work in, in exactly the way that our clients want. So. I think it'd be unfair to say, oh, this one's better than that one because it's kind of, um, you know, dependent on what you want to do with it and whether or not it's going to help you. But the, I think the key thing that I keep coming back to is, you know, H it's not something that HSE is looking for. Uh, and, I, and I say this to the to the manufacturers when I speak to them and they're aware of that. The other thing that, that, the, that, you, you, that you'll get from them when you speak to them is that, you know, most of them won't advocate ongoing monitoring either. You know, they, they see the systems that they're selling very much as the front end of a management structure that is there to try and help you understand what your risks are. But um, coming back to HSE's position, you know, we, we think there's variability in the vibration magnitudes. We think that there's probably variability in any way that you try to monitor or calculate what your exposure times are and you should always be aware of the fact that the key purpose is to do the risk assessment before you go to site and then make sure that you're not exposing people to vibration. I mean there's somebody was asking me about it the other day and, and I was saying well look you know you wouldn't send somebody to go on, up on a roof and work on a roof without doing a risk assessment beforehand and it's the same for vibration. We, we, you know, we've got no our opinion on that is exactly the same, that we'd expect you to have a reasonable understanding of what people are typically or likely to be exposed to before they start doing the work. Thank you. Answered it perfectly. Thanks. Um, 
Right, OK, so that's uh, is my done. Um, I will just start going through questions uh, sent in through the uh, the comment box here. I'll, I'm just going to start from the top. Um, so one question is, do you consider useful the addition of grip force and hand orientation data and the measurements of vibration exposure? Uh, well, that, yeah, I mean, that, again, this comes this. But well, we're talking about we're talking about vibration measurement here, are we? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Measurement of so, yeah. I mean, again, that comes back to that whole, you know, that question mark about using ten percentiles, seventy fifth percentiles. That we that when it comes to doing the vibration measurements, we expect there to be a range because of these things. So we know that, uh, you know, if if I went off and started to use a, a road breaker, I'd probably get a different result from 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 you using it, and we would both get a different result from someone who is expert at using it, who uses it every day. So yeah, things like grip force do affect the vibration exposure uh, or the vibration measurements. Um, there's a question as to whether or not the, the uh, you know, if you're gripping something tighter, uh, the vibration measurements getting affected. Is it is it you know, still representative? Are you getting more or less vibration? And I know that there's a lot of companies just now doing quite a bit of, of research on this to try and figure out you know what what is the effect of that but fun fundamentally that we expect it to be variation in the vibration measurement of a certain extent and that's why even we don't say with any with you know 100 percent certainty this is the vibration you'll get from a particular tool and again that comes back to that risk assessment thing that you know if you get to 72 points you're, you're probably close enough to have to implement the the regulations and it's it's a case of you know if i'm using a number that i think is you know, credible, uh, and I'm putting that into the calculator. Is it telling me enough to let me know? Should I implement the, the requirements of the regulations? Should I have my control, my information instruction training, and my health surveillance? Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Uh, I have another one. So, in the hierarchy of control, um, in administrative controls, isn't training of workers an important part of an overall control strategy? Yeah, um, training is an important part of your, your control measures. I think if, if you remember that that table I put up where we had the big blue box with control measures and stuff like that, and you know, I, I tend to think of information instruction and training as a separate thing. And so if we're talking about training people to understand what the vibration exposures are and how to, uh, you know, recognise when they've got a risk that's in there. But I think what this person is asking about is the idea of training somebody to actually use the tool in a way that reduces their exposure. And that is something that, that is important, you know, so it is important. Like if I came into your to your site, your factory, and I said, what are you doing to control vibration? And you said, well, one of the things that I've done is I've sent everybody off on a, you know, tool usage course so they understand how to use this particular tool in the most efficient way. I personally would consider that to be part of your control activities, not part of your information instruction and training. So I would say that that's something that's making sure people understand how to use that power tool in the most efficient way possible so that, you know, hopefully they're, they're getting through the work quicker or they're not exposing themselves to as much vibration as they may do if they're someone like me who doesn't know how the power tool works and they're a bit of a bringer. So, yeah, definitely have an understanding of how to use the power tool in a correct way can be seen as part of your vibration control activities. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think I have a few more to go. Uh, so on the example of the concrete pouring uh, regarding design stage, mm -hmm. what do you think is the best way of raising the issue of health protection in the construction industry at the design stage? Uh, so uh, I, I think that when it comes to people who design buildings, I think they've got a reasonably good understanding of some of the health and safety risks of the building when it's completed. So that they, they kind of appreciate that, you know, let's not put in windows that, that, that are difficult to clean, so you have to get odd kinds of access to it. But I don't think there's a lot of high level understanding that, you know, simply by specifying a particular product or system or making a decision on how something's going to look, will result in high levels of vibration. So I think some of you have probably seen me talking about the Barbican in, in London, 
which uh, the, the entire building was scrabbled by hand using power tools, which is was a massive, you know, uh, housing development with high rise flats. It was built up in the 70s. And people still sort of look at it now, architectural type people and say, oh, isn't this wonderful? What a, what a great bit of architectural sort of featuring. And uh, so I think the best way to, to try and improve that would be to raise awareness of it amongst designers. I mean, I, I had a conversation with an, an architect uh, who came up to me after I'd done a talk on hand arm vibration and said that he'd been um, that he'd, he'd, he'd been working in, in architecture for 20 odd years and had never heard about this as an issue. So I think there's a need for it to be raised amongst designers, whether it's architects or, or architectural technicians. Um, I think some have got a better understanding of it than others. Uh, but for me, the best way to do it would be to go into the universities and the colleges and the training schools and speak to people at that point so that they understand that yeah, this is something that they need to think about, that there's knock on effects on the design decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, definitely. Yep. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So a couple more. Um, are the documents for dry lining, scaffolding, etc. available on the HSC website? Uh, <laughs> no, they're not. I keep trying to get them up. I've been, they are, they're in a queue for getting published and sadly the queue got a lot longer when COVID came along uh, because everything that wasn't COVID related has kind of been pushed back uh, while we're trying to get that type of stuff out and we've only got one publications team. Um, they are, um, so they are, they are signed off. Um, Theoretically, if you emailed me, I can send you them. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to get 190 emails through, um, uh, but I think the the I, I think the um, UK Hearing Conservation Association put in a request for them. I certainly spoke to Claire about it, and and I think they're they're looking at putting them on their website. Uh, my expectation is that as soon as I can get them through the publications process at HSE. Um, then that will happen. Uh, but I, I would apologise. It is, it is a civil service, so you can imagine that there's a fair level of uh, bureaucracy that I have to go through to get them out. But mm. I'm talking about them now. Uh, they're signed off, and, and you know, if, if anybody asks for them, I, I hand them out as and when they, they do. Oh, right. Excellent. Right. Um, I see a couple more, and then and uh, I'm coming at you hard and fast, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're on the spotlight. Um, so next one is uh, most. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So most vibration activity is open area. So um, direct exposure with sunlight. Uh, so is there any relation available between temperature and vibration? Uh, I'm not sure. If they're saying, do they think the sunlight affects the vibration measurement? Is that the question that they're asking? Or mm, I'm not too sure. in an open area, uh, so person direct exposure with sunlight. Is there any relationship available between temperature and vibration? Yeah, if there's any effect on it. Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, the one thing I do know about uh, temperature and sunlight and such like is that uh, people who live in warm countries tend not to present with things like finger blanching because the, it's never cold enough outside for it to to be triggered. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the things that we do see, uh, particularly about health surveillance, is to try and do it in the winter because people are more likely to remember that they've had, uh, you know, an episode of halves, uh, you know, in the winter, whereas in the summer, when it's not less likely to affect them, they, they forget that it, that happened. But uh, in terms of does the virus, does, temperature effect how the vibration measurement is is collected or the the, the difference in the result I'm afraid I don't know and um, probably our scientists would but I'm, I don't you know maybe think working in the sunlight you're getting sweaty hands maybe you can't quite uh, grip the tool <laughs> enough the yeah, I think if, <laughs> sa sadly if, if one of our scientists was here they could answer that equation but I'm afraid I'm not me. Oh no, fair enough. Um, okay, uh, anti-vibration gloves, do they actually reduce the risk of hand arm vibration effect? Okay, so we we get a lot of questions about, about gloves um, and this maybe slightly comes back to the temperature thing. Uh, we do say that people should just wear, you should wear gloves as a way of keeping your hands warm and that should help reduce the sort of 
severity or the impact of, of vibration, but we don't advocate the use of anti-vibration gloves. If you have a look in our new guidance document, there's actually an entire bit of an, an entire appendix on it. Um, there are standards for testing vibration, anti-vibration gloves, and there are products out there which are classed as anti-vibration gloves. But um, the, the key thing that, that we see is, well, look, in order for you to say that you're using anti-vibration gloves uh, and and they're actually reducing vibration, we would ask you to demonstrate that the glove has been tested with the power tool that you're using and it can be shown to reduce the vibration. Because our experience is that um, a lot of the times they don't and in some instances they may make the vibration uh, exposure worse. So you can buy them. We don't advocate that people use them. We don't really consider it as a, a suitable means of, of, of PPE. Uh, but if you do buy it and you are going to use it, then we will start asking you difficult questions about, right, prove to us that it works, show us the test data that it works with the power tool you're using, uh, and show us that you're getting a significant reduction. Uh, I believe just one more here. Uh, if the current CDM regs are... Oh, Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, if the current CDM regs are not sufficiently addressing construction health and design issues, then could an update to CDM help? Oh. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to have a conversation about CDM because I know it's like it's a whole big thing. Uh, but I, I don't think the issue is, I don't think the issue is with the regulations. And and to be honest with you. And this may sound like a surprising thing from somebody who comes from a, a government enforcement agency to say, but I, I don't think that, that what's needed is more regulation. I think what, what is needed is, is you know, better understanding of, of, the, of what's required from the regulations. And that really is, you know, coming out from the HSE saying this is what we want. And I think that's why there's issues with it. You know, as I say, the, the construction people that I speak to about haves and, and noise, the general kind of response is of, you know, in a design perspective is, oh, I've never really thought about that, but now that you're saying it, it makes sense and and I'll think about it in the future. And and I think it's it's that, it's, you know, the regulations are there um, and people's understanding of them and could be improved. And I think that's what HAC should be trying to do is trying to help companies and businesses understand, look, this is what we want you to spend your time on. Uh, and, and what can you do to, to eliminate these problems before they get to site? So I think it's it's a question of not changing the changing or revamping a set of guidance documents or regulations. It's about you know trying to uh, get the message out that this is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Great. And I I know I said that was the last one, but we've had a couple more in. Are you okay to keep going? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. You've got the time. Yeah. <laughs> We have a good five minutes left. So, um, right. So, would HAC inspectors view a recent independent measurement of vibration magnitude to be more or less accurate than the recent published HSC data for the purpose of a risk assessment? Um, so, in other words, not continual monitoring watches, um, but routine tool magnitude testing. Yeah. So. You remember I showed you the, the calculator and I said, look, here's your tools here with the drop down menus and you select the number that we've, we've put in there. And the purpose of it, as I say, it's like that idea if you don't go on a roof without checking what the issue is beforehand. The, the numbers that we want you to put in the in the, the calculator to help you understand your risk assessment are numbers to give you an indication of do the regulations come into force. The, the measurements that you might be doing on site or that somebody would do on site or might maybe redo on site are there to either tell you, OK, we're using this power tool and HSE doesn't have it on its list, so we have to do the measurement or we're using this particular power tool in a way that's slightly different to the way that it's normally used. And again, that's not on HSE's list, so we have to do the measurement. And that's really the two instances where we would expect people to do vibration measurements. You know, as I say, it's not a regulated requirement to do vibration measurements. The ongoing measurements, the testing of a, of a power tool um, at a later date, you know, that type of measurement, your focus in that case should be, you know, the reason why you're doing that measurement should really be to say, OK, we're going to replace this power tool with another one. 
is it got a lower vibration magnitude than the one we've already bought or we're going to do some measurements on our power tools uh, because we want to see what kind of condition that they're in or is there some that work better than others or there are some individuals who know how to use the power tool better than others and what are they doing and can we train other people with that but it, you know i've seen companies that send their power tools off you know to be tested once a year and that's not something hac advocates or encourages uh, i mean i've heard of companies offshore boxing all the power tools up putting them in a container and shipping them back uh, to test sites which seems like an unusual thing to do because it certainly isn't testing the power tool in use doing the job that it's doing so yeah the numbers in the in the calculation spreadsheet are there to help you determine do the regulations come into force and if they do what am i doing to control that the measurements that you might be doing on site are really to do, cover things like i don't know what this power tool gets because it's not an hse's list or i think there's an issue with this power tool and i want to find out what's wrong with it mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's one more. And you know what? I think I think I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, so we've only a few minutes left and, um, and you're just being rammed. So <laughs> I'll give you a break after this one. Um, would money spent on devices to monitor vibration exposure continuously not provide better risk reduction by being spent on either better tools or shorter maintenance intervals on tools? OK, so that somebody asking about is the ongoing me ongoing measurement a better way of controlling risk than buying lower vibration tools? Is that that that's what they're saying? Is that right? I believe so. Monitor vibration continuously, not provide better risk reduction by being spent on either better tools or shorter um, exposure durations. Yes, yes, I think so. Right. So um I just be just seeing the right thing here. <laughs> uh, Ah, right, so there's the question they're asking is, you know, is, is, is you're going to get better reduction from, from ongoing monitoring than, than buying lower vibration tools and, and such like. Um, if you're going to do ongoing monitoring, as I said before, we don't, we, not something that we advocate. If you're going to do it, you have to have a reason for doing it. Uh, if the reason for doing it is that you're going to use it, so you, you're, going to, you're going to pick a number, you're going to say, I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure they don't go above 100 points or make sure they don't go above 200 points and you're using a monitoring system to effectively uh, stop people from carrying on using power tools when they get to whatever limit that you've set, then that isn't something that we are particularly keen on because you're working up to a value and you know with the best will in the world, people will go over that value either purposefully or mistaken, mistakenly. Uh, so we're not hugely keen on that. If you're going to spend money on trying to control vibration. Uh, this is the same for, for anything that, that when it comes to, to control, the things that you spend money on, which give you control for multitudes of people, tends to be better than something that's gonna give you control for a single individual. So if you're going to go out and buy a power tool, which you know doesn't require somebody to physically put their hands on it, or it's got significantly lower vibration, that's going to be a better way of controlling vibration risk than actively monitoring how much exposure people have when they're using a particular power tool. So you have to think about it in the sense of what, again, what are you getting from a monitoring system that's going to give you additional benefit beyond what you've got in terms of the other control measures that are in place? And as I said before, if you're using the monitoring system, we're still going to ask you the questions about the lower vibration tools. So it's not a choice between the two. If you decide to buy the monitoring system, we'll still ask you why you haven't bought the lower vibration tools. Mm. Oh, no. Fair enough. Um, uh, that question was from Rupert. Rupert, I did see your hand went up. If you still want to um, say anything, raise your hand again, and then you can un un unmute yourself. But um, if, oh, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes. You okay, uh, it, 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 was just, it was just a slight clarification uh, on, on the question. I, um, I'm, I'm always conscious that organisations have a limited amount of money to spend on yeah. on protecting worker health, and I'm always wanting to get sort of the most or advise them to get the most benefit from their yeah. budget. And, and I always question uh, whether the, the investment in buying continuous monitoring devices couldn't be better put to use 
by maintaining the equipment better or by buying more expensive, less vibration. And, and as you've quite rightly pointed out, um, equipment that perhaps doesn't require um, the hands to be used uh, to, to hold the hold the tool in place. Um, and I, I do. You, I, so the question is, do, do you ask organisations to justify um, how, how they've actually made that decision and, and they haven't just gone, well, we'll shorten our maintenance intervals on equipment by three months from now on. Uh, and that would that would that would provide us with better risk reduction. Yeah, I mean, as I say, if they're, if they're using the monitoring system to help them understand when they put in their, their maintenance schedule and, and such like, uh, that's a good thing. But a, a lot of these things kind of fall back to what I can actually ask for as a as a health and safety inspector. So I can't I can't ask I can't ask for gold plating. So if if you particularly on the maintenance aspect of power tools. Uh, I, I would expect a company to do maintenance on their power tools, but uh, if, you know, how, what can I ask for? Well, all I can really ask for is what the maintenance schedule is specified by the tool manufacturer. I can't say do more or, or, or do, do it at more frequent intervals. I can only really ask for what the tool manufacturer would expect. I think handheld grinders is a good example. You know, we understand that they're at a price point now where most companies don't do maintenance on a on a small grinder. They simply buy a, a new one, um, and then we would be asking them, "Well, are you buying one that's got lower vibration?" But I think your your kind of key point is, you know, spend the money on the monitoring system uh, to help you understand what the vibration exposures are and whether or not you need to replace tools, and that that's fair enough. But we would still be asking the question about. You know whether you had the monitoring system or not, we'd still be asking questions about what is your tool maintenance process? When are you replacing those tools? When do you intend to replace them? Why aren't you looking at lower vibration tools? So it's it's a some of these products can be quite a, a, a financial cost to implement them, and certainly for some companies we we've said to them, well look, you know, the type of thing you're doing, you know, small road working company. For the money you're spending there, you could probably get yourself like a mini digger and reduce your exposures and eliminate your exposures. Excellent. Well, you know what? We're we're uh, we ran over for time. Goodness, so many uh, great questions and great answers from Chris. Thank you so much. Um, I, I did have somebody asking if if they get a copy of the presentation. You did send it to me as a PDF. Um, also, this is being recorded, so we'll go on uh, YouTube under you know the OHS uh, YouTube page, so you can watch it back um, if you join late. Uh, but I, I think I'm going to cut off here, or else we'll be here forever talking about noise and vibration. But uh, just thank you so much once again to Chris. Excellent, covered just absolutely everything there. Um, and I, I do have some ideas in mind for future webinars. Um, so do keep your eyes peeled, stay tuned. Um, nothing set in stone yet, so I can't make any promises. But uh, a few ideas I have in mind. Um, I would love to do a webinar on statistics around testing compliance with exposure limits. Hoping to do that one quite soon. Potential speaker on uh, competency, uh, possibly a webinar on upcoming changes to the group authority license SOP for ISO signate monitoring. So these are all um, ideas. I'm working on it. Yes, no promises, but keep your eyes peeled. Keep looking for for uh, the the um, you know adverts out for for these webinars because they these are just working great. We are getting so much interest, so much participation, and let's keep it going. That's I just need speakers like Chris to uh, to want to participate. So um, wonderful, but yeah, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Excellent, Chris. So well done, amazing, and um, yeah, until next time. <laughs>